Friends of Edgerton Ryerson Percents. Words from Edgerton Ryerson. Part 2. I became the superintendent of schools for Canada West, what Upper Canada was called at the time. Education at that time was quite haphazard. While there were school boards, they had varying degrees of support. Trained teachers were very hard to get. There was no teacher training in the entire colony. Textbooks were what you could find. Often they were American textbooks with American ideas. And one of the big things was that particularly in rural areas, children either didn't bother going to school, left school after two or three years, or attended school sporadically. Farm children had to help on the farms. Children often would apprentice out as blacksmiths and other trades. So the amount of education that a child got varied considerably. In 1844-45, I traveled extensively through Europe studying education and educational systems. I brought all that information back and my efforts translated into an educational act in 80, 1846, one in 1850, and one in 1871, which established a highly structured, highly effective education system something which was copied in Western Canada as the West opened up. Some of my ideas were even exported to Britain. So I was very, very effective in all of this. What I did starting in 1846 was to regularize the teaching. In 1847, I actually created a normal school to train teachers. In fact, in 1850, the education department got the money to buy a piece of land in Toronto. On this, I built the education building, which you see in front of you. I arranged for reproductions of classic statues, uh, art, uh, copies of art, famous art pieces, so that people could come into the education building and learn more about the world. But behind it, I built, or I had built, a normal school which would train the teachers of the future. You can just see part of it behind the education building where I had my offices. So as of 1846, you could start to get trained teachers. In the same act, I arranged for Canadian textbooks. They were standardized textbooks. You didn't have to take them, but if you didn't, you didn't get any money to support your school. These textbooks emphasized, particularly ones that I started to write, hard work, organization, morals, all the things that I believed in and incorporated in my sermons. These would be part of the educational system. The local boards were to be given money from taxes on families that used the schools. Later on, everybody had to contribute to it, whether they had children in the school or not. The crowning glory, I guess you'd say, of this was in 1871, when education was made free and compulsory to age 14. So students could not opt out. They had to get at least a basic education. In 1850, I also strengthened the grammar schools, which became known as secondary schools. Up to that time, grammar schools and common schools basically taught the same thing, the very foundations of education. But I arranged for the government to finance the grammar schools. And that from that time on, they offered a higher level of education. So I was very successful in all these things. Unfortunately, a side issue during this period caused the uh, what I would call the blight, the blot on my reputation. In 1846, government officials met with the leaders of the various Indigenous communities across what is now Southern Ontario. Most of this was done at a meeting at what is now the site of Aurelia, but at that time was really wilderness.
what the government was proposing was the latest version of how they would deal with indigenous people. Remember that in the late 1830s, Francis Bond had, had started confiscating land, land that people were actually living on. This had caused such a fuss that the British government had abandoned this policy, and they ultimately came up with an idea that what they should do was to offer the indigenous communities, indigenous people, education, so they could fit in equally with the white settlers. In their return, the indigenous people were expected to move to certain areas, that is, to congregate. This would get them out of the way of settlement and allow the land where they hunted and fished to be developed as farms. The leaders, the chiefs, said no to congregating to get it together in certain areas. They wanted to keep their communities. But they overwhelmingly said yes to education. They wanted to learn to farm so they could, in a sense, compete with white settlers. That is, they wouldn't be at the mercy of the settlers. Those chiefs who rejected this idea of education went back to their communities and the community said, yes, yes, we want education. And so the leaders agreed, a lot of them, that they would give a quarter of their annual monies from the government, which was part of payment for occupying indigenous lands, to support the schools. On the basis of this, in 1847, George Varden, who was a senior official in the British Indian Department, wrote me and said, can you please provide a framework for these manual labor schools? I was busy. I was working on education. I just brought out my 1846 act, so I didn't get back to him right away. As a result, he wrote me another letter. And in that letter, he said this, you are aware that there are numerous persons in the colony, though actuated by different motives, who will alike rejoice in the failure of a plan which tends to place the Indian on a footing of perfect equality with their white brethren. So here was a senior official in the Indian department saying, this is what we want to do, to place the Indian, as they were called in those days, on a footing of perfect equality with their white brethren. So this is what I was asked to deal with. I wrote basically a letter, some people call it a report, so we'll call it that, explaining what was necessary. And this is where people have criticized me and ruin my reputation. One of the things I said was that the Indian is in uncivilized. Another thing I said was that they would need religion to bring the Indian to a level of civilization. Now, this sounds quite demeaning, and this is what people have said about me. But those people, intentionally or unintentionally, do not understand the language of the day. Saying that the First Nations were uncivilized did not mean what it means today. The theory of the day among political philosophers was that there were three stages of development. One was nomadic, the second was hunter-gatherer, and the third was civilized, the level to which we had reached. So what I was talking about was how to bring people from the second stage, the hunter-gatherer stage, to the next stage to be able to compete. These schools, in my mind and in the government's mind, were all about making indigenous people equal, able to compete and preserve their culture. Nobody seems to notice when I talked about the failings, the lack of development of indigenous people and the need for religion, I said the same things about the working class in our society. The working class spent a lot of their leisure time drinking, drinking and basically wasting effort. So from my experience with the Mississaugas back in the 1820s, I learned that religion and the Methodists taught that drinking alcohol was sinning, that this would help people give up alcohol and lead a productive life. The leth lethargy and the drinking, the alcoholism that had so distinguished indigenous society had led, led to indigenous societies across Upper Canada declining in numbers. And this was an attempt to preserve them. 
Now, a report done recently at Victoria University said I wanted to create an agricultural servant class. If you read what I wrote in this letter or report, what I said was I wanted Indigenous people to be supervisors of large farms, to have farms of their own, not to be agricultural servants. And my idea was that the schools that would be set up would ultimately be run by Indigenous people themselves. In fact, my friend Peter Jones was in line to take over one of those schools. But unfortunately, ill health prevented him from doing so. So here you have it. What I'm being accused of is demeaning Indigenous people, of trying to force religion on them. We've already talked about that. Indigenous people welcomed Christianity and they added it to their culture. It didn't displace their culture. What I was suggesting was a regime which would include religious instruction, such as you get in Sunday school. Also, it would include lessons and things you would learn in the regular school system and working on farms. And the government promised they would live, give land for the graduates to farm. And they were going to build three schools. The residential schools that were created by the federal government after Confederation, after I was dead, in fact, were really very different, both in purpose and in operation from the ones created using my ideas, which were designed to create indigenous students who would become the equal of their fellow farmers. The residential schools set up by the Canadian government were designed to assimilate, to force students to become like white people, Euro-Canadians. The way the schools operated was also different. And the schools set up under my advice, children could come and go as they pleased. They were taught by professional teachers wherever possible. These were in fact people trained in the normal school. The students could wear their own clothes and there was emphasis on knowledge rather than indoctrination. These were people who were being trained to be farmers. And they were also given, as I mentioned, a version of what we would learn in the regular schools. The whole idea that I was responsible for residential schools was raised by Ryerson University, depicted here. The university put a plaque up in 2018, which said I was the chief architect of residential schools. When Victoria University did a very short report about me, because of course, as I've said, I was the founder of Victoria University. When they looked at it, they simply said, I was going to create a bunch of servants for farmers, an agricultural servant class. Nowhere in my report did I say that. Ryerson University eventually set up a task force to study the whole matter, to study what I left behind. They determined that I was a friend to indigenous people. And they said nothing about me being architect of residential schools. In fact, for them, the only thing they could say was that I denigrated indigenous people, the very people I was a friend to. The proof, while in Britain raising money for the missions to the First Nations, I supposedly said nasty things about the Mohawks. Among other things, I said they were vicious before the missionaries came and improved their lives. Vicious did not mean the same thing as it did now. This is another case where the people who came up with these ideas either didn't want to know the change in language or purposely misquoted. When I called them vicious, what it meant was full of vice, like many First Nations people. Mohawks had been discouraged by the changes in Upper Canada, Canada West, and had lapsed into indolence, into alcohol consumption, and had lost their drive. So it was not a criticism of the Mohawks. This was actually a plea for help for Indigenous people. None of the claims about me being involved with residential schools were true. What you see in this picture 
are three buildings. The middle building is the original Mount Elgin School or Muncie School. There were two schools created by the government, one at Mount Elgin, which was very close to a large number of indigenous people, and one at Alderville. There was supposed to be free, but the government decided not to build the last one. I had nothing to do with the schools once I made my report, and unfortunately, they were not a success. There were various reasons, most of which had to do with the government. For one, they didn't build a northern school, a third school. The northern First Nations decided after a while it was too far to go. The children were very unhappy being so far away. So they stopped sending children down to the two existing schools and they stopped contributing money. And that's one of the controls that the First Nations had over this process. They provided a lot of the money. The other reason was that the government had promised that the graduates would have land to farm once they finished. Well, the government didn't provide it. On top of that, the way these schools were set up, the hours were very long, particularly in the summer when they had to work in the fields. And a lot of them who were children just couldn't take it and left. So children were regularly just walking away from the schools. By the early 1860s, the schools were in decline. And by Confederation, one had closed and one was down to a very small number of students. They were revived after Confederation as government residential schools. You can see the new residential school uh, as the front building. But these were very different from the original idea, as I have said. So this whole idea of me being against First Nations and of me being responsible for residential schools was not true. In the report that Ryerson University issued, they made some other claims against me, which I will talk about. But this was the main claim against me that I had been responsible for residential schools. The other accusations made against me included one that I created black separate schools. This would have been in my 1850 school act. The others that I tried to create separate schools for people with disabilities, that I tried to create separate schools for the very poor, and I was against females having an education. None of these are true. With regard to the first, before the 1850 legislation went through, I heard from a number, quite a number, of white settlers from the areas where there was a large population of black settlers. Many of these people had come on the famous Underground Railroad. And the white settlers wanted separate schools. I tried, I tried very hard to persuade them not to press this issue, but they were adamant they had to have black separate schools, so the white students would not have to share the schools. Or if they did in some cases share them, they would do it at different times of the day. My letter to the Prime Minister said just how horrified I was by this, that I believed it was totally wrong to legislate black separate schools. This was a blot on our British Constitution. So my suggestion, which the government followed, because I didn't have the authority to do this, was that individual districts be allowed to decide whether or not they would have separate schools. The result of this was that separate schools were in existence in southwestern Canada West and around Hamilton. But the largest part of Canada West remains free of this blot. I did my best. I didn't want separate schools at all. Everybody should have the same level of education, the same opportunities. This was something I said over and over again. So this was a great disappointment. The irony of this can be seen in the photograph of a school class in Amherstburg near Windsor in around 1890. As you can see, the irony of all this is that with some of the black 
was that some of the black schools were so good that white parents sent their students, their children, to the black schools. In some cases, black parents appealed to me and said, once the 1850 legislation went through, we're paying school tax, we can't send our children to the schools. I was a civil servant. I didn't have the authority to order changes. So I sent these people to the courts where they had mixed results. One decision was that if you paid taxes, you had the right to send to the, your child to whatever school you wanted. But not all cases had a similar resolution. As to the other changes, that I wanted to create separate schools for people with disabilities, I find this funny, sad funny. Most people went to small schools or often one or two rooms with one or two teachers had to teach multiple levels, multiple grades. To have to do that, to look after people with disabilities who would learn at a different rate and in a different way would have been very, very difficult. So my idea was to create special school for people with disabilities where they could get an adequate education that is one equal to what people got in the regular schools. And the same idea was in my proposal to create separate schools, special schools for the very poor. We're talking about children who lived on the streets, children who worked in factories, people who normally wouldn't think of going to school. And my hope was that these schools, had they been created, would have given these people the same opportunities for an equal education. Regarding females in education, this is a distortion of what I believed. What I really said was that because most female students were going to become wives or servants, they really didn't feel the need for an education beyond primary school. I didn't say they shouldn't have it. I was just saying that probably well under 10% of females would want to go to grammar schools, secondary schools. Perhaps the best evidence of this is Upper Canada Academy. When it was founded, anyone could attend it. Males, females, indigenous people, anyone who wanted to attend. So I was never against females having an education. I just felt that most of them would not want to take advantage of higher education. When I died in 1882, there was an all-pervading feeling that I had done so much for education. I had changed education so much, not just in Ontario, but elsewhere, that I should be commemorated. So that there was a collection taken up. The people of Ontario contributed money to have a statue of me made. Yes, there were contributions from governments, the provincial government, the city government, but a lot of the money came from individuals, even from students and teachers who felt so thankful for what I'd done. This statue was erected in front of the administration, the education building where I had spent so many years. This was done in 1883. This was a public subscription to build a monument to my accomplishments. This is what happened to my statue. Because Ryerson University put up a sign saying I was responsible for residential schools, while the task force was looking at my legacy, a group of people, a lot of them angry indigenous people, toppled the statue, cut off the head, smashed it, dropped it in Lake Ontario, and then put it on a pike down at Caledonia, where there was an ongoing protest by Indigenous people. The university did nothing to stop this. And the two chairs of the task force issued a statement saying they were sorry that the people who wanted the statue gone weren't there to see it torn down. Hardly an unbiased statement. So this really was an attack on my accomplishments, unreasoned and uncontrolled, I should say. Even though the task force did not find that I was responsible for residential schools, the sign is still up. 
The attack on the statue was not based on facts. It was based on a twisting of the facts. Here I am as an old man. And as an old man, I think I'm entitled to some last words. My critics in my day, and there weren't many, but there were some, said I was too full of myself. I was too sure of myself. Well, if you look at my accomplishments in the field of education, in defending the plurality of religion in Upper Canada, in attempting to help Indigenous people get ahead, I think I'm entitled to be fairly proud of myself. What I want to say is you must be on guard. There are those people today who would twist the past to justify actions in the present. They make people like me who have no guilt in the guilty people. You must be on guard, guard against that. If you've listened to what I had to say, and all this is backed up by my writings and the writings of other, you will see the truth in it. And truth is important. We must have reconciliation, but we must also have truth. Reconciliation because we, the Euro-Canadians, the white people, whatever you want to call us, we did not treat our fellow humans well. Think of residential schools. Think of the way the Mississauga were crowded out of their credit mission. And there are endless other things I could mention. We must find a way to compensate for that. But we must have truth. We must not distort the past to justify what we are doing in the present.